So now if you have your Bibles, I want you to open them up to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Uh, how many of you have been how many of you been reading? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it 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 as you read it, it just starts to place it in your in your mind. It starts to to those words start to visit you during the week. Have they not? I, I would ask, have they not visited you? I think they would. I don't know how you couldn't uh, have these things come up if you've been reading them. And, of course, James is the practitioner of the faith. If you had to put down a title for James, he's called James the Just. He's called James the, the, the brother of Jesus. He's called James the Apostle. But James is a practitioner, and one of the things that I've heard from a number of you, again, is you like the book of James because it's so practical. It's written in such a way as to say, do these things. And it, it is, that's a fair assessment of the book. It's a fair assessment of the way that James wrote the book. Um, nothing is more practical than asking a question like this. Who do you live for? Who do you live for? Nothing's more practical than that. We are all doers. So when you came to church this morning, you did something. What would you do? You came to this building. You came. We're all doers. Only dead people don't do things. And we'll see later on how James says faith is a doer. Faith is not a listener only. Faith is a doer. And practice... Practice is the meat of a person's life direction. What a person practices. We have a practitioner of veterinarian right here. That's what he does. He's a practitioner of veterinarian science and care. We are all practitioners. We have a nurse practitioner. It's even in her title sitting back there. It's what she does. So, I want you to fill in these blanks real quick. Practice makes... James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of endurance produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This is how he begins. He says, do these things. Practice them. Practice makes perfect. Practice what you preach. James 1, 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word, not merely hearers only who delude themselves. So again, one of the things that is, is foundational that I, I think you see and I see, and, and believers, non-believers believe in this one law. They believe in this law called the law of non-contradiction. If you say you're going to do this and you do this instead, you have just contradicted yourself. Even non-believers get it. It's in the news every day, as far as I can see. It's all the fact-checking that goes on now. Was that a lie or is that not a lie? Those kinds of things. All these people, all people believe in this law of non-contradiction. There's a fundamentalness to it. There's a, a, a groundness to it. We want to have solid ground to stand on. And so if somebody says something, we expect them to do what? to do what they say. Now, of course, what do you think about politicians? So again, we've learned to say about a politician what? They don't mean what they say. We don't want to be like that as believers. We want to mean what we say. Do what you say. James 2.14 what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? We'll look at that in a couple weeks. But uh, this is, again, the desire that James would have for us, the practitioner of the faith, that we too would be practitioners of the faith. You have to practice. Let me pray as we start some more here. Father, again, as we dive into these words that um, we have been given through one of your servants. And it's hard for me to comprehend sometimes that this man grew up in the same whole home that Jesus did. But Lord, you've given words to him for us. Help us to hear them. Help us to make adjustments. Help us to change our practices. 
Help us to see the life that you've promised to us and the blessing that comes from it. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, James never uses the word follow. If, you, if you've been reading it, you'll never find that word in the book. You'll never find follow in the book. He never uses it. But as a disciple of Jesus Christ, we, are, we follow in practices that he has given to us. And every day is a will-I-follow-him kind of day. I want you to think about that. Every day as a believer in Jesus Christ is a will-I-follow-him today kind of day. Anywhere you're at, whatever you're doing, will I follow him? Is there going to be something for me to do to follow in in this particular place? I don't think there's a, a situation or circumstance where you wouldn't find something to follow him in in any particular day. James would have us to be practical poets. Um, James 1, 22 and 25. You see that faith was working with his works, and the works were perfected. Uh-oh, did I give her the wrong one? I think it's 1, 22 and 25. So I'll just read them to you. Be ye doers of the word. Did you hear the ye? Where did that come from? King James, Right? Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. That's verse 22. Verse 25, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the, the law of liberty, and perseveres being no hearer but forget, and forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The doer is a, is a term, paiotes, and it's, it's a poet. It's where you get the term poet in Greek. Now, is it the only meaning that this word has? No, it's used all over the New Testament. But I just thought it was really interesting is that in some ways, a doer is a poet. And as our faith is in some ways to be poetry. Now, some of you are going to say, I'm not a poet. But I think you'll see this. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Here's Paul. How many of you apply this verse on a regular basis? How many of you are doers of this on a regular basis? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I will say rejoice. Paul put these words to poetry. In Acts chapter 16, verse 25, we read this. And the one in whom the... Oh, nope, here we go. But about the midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. What town was he in when he did this? Philippi. What had just happened to him before he and Silas did this? They were beaten with rods and thrown into prison and into the stocks. What did they do after they were beaten? put into the stocks, and at night, they began to sing. They began praying out loud. And who was listening to them? The prisoners were listening to them. Now, And the guards were listening to them. And so as this is poetry. This is being a doer of what he then later on writes to the Philippians to do. They are to rejoice. And he showed them with his life how to do it. That's that's what it is to be a disciple. That's what it is to be somebody who is a doer of the word and not a hearer only. A doer is a maker, a producer, one who uses what's available to them to express appropriately what is needed in the moment. He takes what God has given him in his word, And he finds ways to apply it, to to be a doer of it in any given situation that he's in. Whether it's a grocery store, whether it's the post office, whether it's at a game. A believer is being, if he's letting the word of God inform him, he is looking for ways to be a poet in the moment. I came across this little poem by Timothy Johnson. You are different. How so? Look at everyone else. They are merely words, while you are poetry. They stand out. And brothers and sisters, that's what we're supposed to do in some ways. Now, I'm not asking for us to be peacocks. 
I go for a walk down Weedle on, on a regular basis now, and it's about a mile down there somewhere, some farm's got peacocks. You can hear a peacock all from miles away. Um, that's not what I'm asking for us to do, to be kind of like a peacock. But I, I do want us to become poets with our faith. Find ways to apply our faith in the midst of whatever situation we, we find ourselves in. So in this main body that we're in today, in verses 19 through 25 this morning, I want to take a look at some of this poetry and how this works. Um, we're supposed to be poetry in motion, I guess you could put it that way. Someone who makes, uh, who, who moves in a way that is graceful and beautiful. Now that may sound like it's always got to be your body doing it, but that's not true. It's you doing it as you live for him. I think Jesus is, I don't know about you, but he's the most beautiful person there is. And there's just times I try to imagine being able to be, you know, be where, when, when he was here. What, what was it like to just be by him? And so I've, we watched over, the, over, the, over this time, there's a, um, a, a gospel, new gospel kind of movie, video, I don't know what, TV show called The Chosen. If you haven't watched it, it's worthwhile. Uh, they've done a really good job of portraying the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it, it may jar you because it won't, it, it, you might have a hard time thinking that Jesus actually smiled. But he was poetry in motion. He was faith in motion. He was God-directed motion all the time. And as disciples, that's what we want to start to look. That's what we want to become. That's what James is shooting for. That's what he wants, wants, he wants us. Let's read verses 19 through 21. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. Now, this comes out of the thoughts that preceded it in verses 17 and 18, especially the idea of the word of truth becoming implanted. It's the good and perfect gift that God has given. He is, he is the one who gives good and perfect gifts all the time. Um, so this is when people argue with God that, why did this happen? doesn't mean what happened was necessarily good, but it does mean that he is good in the midst of whatever it is. Is COVID-19 a good thing? No. Is God good in the midst of this? Yes. Is the math hard to do sometimes? Yes. But that we need to trust and walk through. So the, the things that come out of this is that the word of truth, it says there in verse 18, out of his own will, this is God's will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So again, this idea that we should demonstrate before other people and ourselves and together, we should demonstrate what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. He then says with this word, though, what are you to do with the word? What are you supposed to do with the word? You're to receive it implanted. That's what we find down in verse 21. Receive with meekness the implanted word. And so if you've been doing, if you do Bible study, and if you like to mark your Bibles up, you know, if, you take, if you take the word word and you highlight it, you'll start to see it make all these little connections in there. Now, you don't want to just become a student that just makes all these connections. Because again, to make the connections is to make the connection to what? What's the most important connection you want to make? It's the walking in it. It's the doing of it. It's the living in it. That's what you want to make the connection of. But when you study the Word, when you, when you take the text out, you look for these kinds of things. So I encourage you, if you're not a Bible marker, it's sometimes it's a really good thing to do. Just mark your Bibles up and look for those connections because they'll start to help you see how these things work together. But receive with meekness the implanted word. How? Well, it's given. It's not of our own making. So if we, if we don't, and literally, if we don't pick this up and read it, it won't come from inside us. It's got to be given to us. And this is what bothers me right now about morality in our nation right now. There's this, desire, this, this idea that morality is something from within people. Oh, no, 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 no. 
morality, truth, is outside of us. It's in God. And without him, man will create his own moralities. Dangerous, dangerous thing. But it's given to us. It's received with humility. And, and, and the way that James talks about receiving in humility here is literally listen. Listen. Listening is a very difficult thing to do. But it is what we have to practice. Now, he says an illustration of this is that we are to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. It is that we are supposed to, um, again, just as he says, do it. Be slow to anger. But generally, in general statement, this is true. Know this, beloved brethren, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. That's generally a good thing to think about, really. In marriages, in business, in anything like that, have you ever been talked over by somebody? You're talking, and all of a sudden, you can't talk anymore because they're talking to you. Have you ever been such a way that uh, you've said something, or some, uh, better yet, your wife has said something to you, and then a few moments go by, and you say something that is totally unconnected to what she said? You have not been listening. So this is generally good advice. You can go to the Proverbs. There's, there's Proverbs about this, the idea of listen, listen before you speak. But this is, this is going down deeper. This is where, this is where we're need who we're listening to. Specifically, this is, in, this is implied from verse 18. So everybody be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Why? Because of the implanted word, because of what God has said to you. He is the one who has given this to you. It is better to listen first to what he has said. Let it come in. Let it, let it, let it specifically let this implanted word come in. Now, James gives a reminder when he says, slow to anger. I don't know. Uh, I'm going to get this out of, my, out of my sermon speech. I don't know about you, but I, 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 you know, it's been fun to watch myself, actually. Because as you watch yourself, you see mannerisms. And you see things that you do habitually. I need to improve some of those. I must bore you to death some days with him. But James is trying to, when he comes to this idea of, say, slow to anger. It is amazing how fast people, myself included, can become angry. Have you seen that in yourself? Have you seen how easy it is for you to become angry? Anger always is sourced in something. Again, James is writing to Jewish background believers. As he writes to them, he writes to a people that have been under persecution of some kind, shape, or form, even now to this day, the Jewish people have been an afflicted people. For millennia. But he's writing back then, 2,000 years ago, he's writing to these Jewish background believers who have this this desire to, to please God and do the things, and everybody around them won't let them do it the way they want to do it. The Romans are always telling them what they can and cannot do. Other nations around them are always persecuting them. The Greek culture is trying to infiltrate into them and to take their children away from them. Sound familiar? So when he says, don't become angry, he's really saying, you've got to listen to the implanted word and look for the way that the Lord has asked you to walk at this moment in this time. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to evangelical background believers. Uh, evangelicals that I, I have found evangelicals to be very concerned about doing things right, being right. Because we represent God, and so therefore we want to do everything right. We also must be careful that we do not let bubble, bubble up inside us anger. Are there things to be angry about? Are there injustices out there? Are we treated fairly by the media? All these kinds of things. No. No. So, 
What does God want us to do? That's what James is, That's where James is headed. That's what we want to see. So again, I would speak to us as evangelicals. I would say this. Do not try to live for God without him. Do not try to be righteous without him. Our anger will not accomplish the things that God wants to do. We must work on trusting him. Remember, God is not not so much concerned about you being good. Maybe this is provocative. God is not so much interested in you being good as you trusting him. Because if you trust his word, you will be his witness, and you will do the things, the doer of the word, in the moment, you will be a poet in the moment. James says, therefore, put aside all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the word implanted. Uh, This is kind of fun. Uh, Filthiness here is, again, a Greek word. And in the Attic Greek, in other words, uh, before New Testament Greek, this word comes out of a term for earwax. Now, Yeah, clean out your ears. Get rid of the filthiness. Now, is he literally talking about literal earwax? No. But he's talking about the junk that comes into our lives that clog us up. Now, again, I'm speaking to modern people here. One of the greatest cloggers of our, of our, of our ears is the media around us and the, how we have partaken in all the media around us. Now, I can't, I can't come down and you say, don't watch TV anymore. Don't, don't see any movies anymore. Don't watch any TV shows. I, don't, I, I, don't, I can't do that. But isn't it amazing how much binging on video has happened in these last 10 weeks? People just sitting in front of their television, just letting all this stuff come in. What was the one that, was, that started this up? Tiger whatever, you know? What was it called? Tiger King. Tiger King. I never watched it, but I, I, I got enough of it to go... What are people doing? What is this stuff? It's earwax. It's just filling up and clogging their ability to hear God's word and to take it in. And when he says rampant evil, he's talking about the ugly, demeaning things uh, that have entangling ways of pulling us down. This is where many times on job sites when I was working in a more hearty job of being a plumber or working in window service. I've done a lot of construction. It was part of my my early years. And in the Marines, of course. This is the crude jokes. Things like that. Uh, Just, you don't participate in stuff that's demeaning. You don't participate in, you don't let it come in. You really, like James says here, he says, therefore put it away. That might mean in some places, for putting it away, it might mean walking away from something. But when it comes to what you let in your, in your being through our media and stuff, it may mean putting it away. I can't balance that for each of you. I can't. But James is telling us, be careful about earwax, the stuff that comes and clogs your your thinking up, and be careful that you don't entangle yourself in things that are demeaning and evil and not good. Instead, what are you supposed to do? Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We receive the implanted word. To receive the word implanted is to think and act in terms of repentance, faith, and obedience. Those things, those three things should be on your list every day as, as you come to the Word, as you let the Word dwell in you. There comes a place where there's a place for repentance, there's a place for faith, there's a place for obedience in the Word every day. Receive it with humility. Be a teachable person before God's Word. It's the implanted word. Matthew 13, 23, Jesus' parable of the soils. 
And the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. But when I planted seeds this, this spring and I put the, the seed in the ground, it didn't look like anything for a long time. And then over a few days, you could see something pushing out. That's what it is to receive the word of God. It's to let it come in and let it start pushing out. Let God have his way. Teachable. Doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. There's two different kinds of deceit here. If you saw earlier as you were doing this, in verse 16 of chapter 1, it says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Brothers, Don't be deceived. And then he talks about down here, um, where is it at here? Doers, not deceiving yourselves. And so what is this about deceit? Why is, um, I've said to you many times, nobody lies to you more than who? Yourself. Why? Why do you lie to yourself? Because you're protecting yourself. Because in some ways, it, we can become before God's word like, how many of you love to be wrong? I mean, it's, you go out every morning, you, go, you face the day and go, I'm looking to be wrong today. We hate to be wrong. Nobody brings this out of me more than my wife, Angie. Notice she's not at the first service this morning. <laughs> Nobody likes to be wrong. And so we deceive ourselves in many different ways. I could, there's all kinds of stuff to talk about there, but I want to go on to what James has here. In verse 16, the idea of deceiving has the idea of don't, don't be drawn off by a planet. It's the word planao. It's where, where we get planet from. Don't set your course of life by a planet, because what will happen if you set your course by a planet as a sailor? It'll start going. So which is the North Star? Was it move? Technically, no, but you set by something that doesn't move. Don't be deceived by things that move. Does man have all kinds of moving objects for you to trust in? Absolutely. If you've ever been a salesman, get this comb and you'll never, or get this hairbrush and your hair will be beautiful and it falls apart or it pulls your hair out. No. We need to set our course. Don't be deceived. Set your course on that which never moves. God never changes. He never vacillates. He doesn't. There's no variation, shifting shadow, James says. Set your course by him. The other deceit that he talks down here, though, is a little bit different. It comes from a different word. It comes from logic that comes alongside you. Logic that comes alongside you. This is what Satan did with Eve. He came alongside Eve with some logic. No, he's trying to hold off. He's trying to keep things from you. He's trying to hold back from you. What he really doesn't want you to do is become like him. And so he's kept you from doing this. If you go do this, you'll know. And so he comes alongside with logic. And we'll see this later on. James will talk about the Satan and the devil and how he does these things. But that's what this deceit is that James is talking. Don't let something come alongside you and argue you away from the faith. Argue you away from trusting God. Don't be deceived by good logic. Instead, again, he emphasizes this. Be a doer. Be a poet of the living of living with God. Be a poet of living with God. Supply, you know, let God supply the language. Let God supply the actions. Let God supply the implanted word for you to walk in. Let him give it to you. So again, I ask the question that I began with. Who do you live for? That's the main question of a disciple of Jesus Christ. Who do you live for? And again, it's got that little word in there, do. Who do you do for? Now, verses 23, 
He goes on and says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like, so this is a simile, this is a comparison. He is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once, forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer only but who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. So a man in a mirror, I've, I've wrestled with this as I've, over the years. As I've, how does, what is James really trying to say here? So this is new. Uh, this will not be here next week, probably, this mirror up here. This is intended only for this lesson this morning. But um, I often thought, well, does that mean if you come over to the mirror and you see this here and you walk away, you go, you don't remember what, I, don't, I don't remember what I look like? No, I, I, I've, I'm kind of familiar with his face. I see it every day. Kind of familiar with it. So when he says, you go over and you look, in, and he says, you look intently. You look intently in the mirror. What is he talking about? What is he trying, what is he trying to, to get at here? And of course, the, the, the simile will bring it out. But the way I can see it is this way, is that Some of you are smiling at me. Why? Is there something wrong with me? It's, it carries more of that idea that you see something. You look intently and you see something, but you don't deal with it. You walk away. You see it, but you don't, you don't deal with it. You walk away. I'll just, I, I was going to do this in closing, but I'll do it here. I'll give you a little bit of homework. Look up Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, and you'll get an idea of what James is talking about. What he does, though, is he does this. It says that the man goes in front of the mirror. He sees something wrong with I, I would, I would, I would classify it as he sees something that he's not doing or he should be doing, and he walks away and forgets about it and just goes away. Instead, he contrasts him to the man who, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and there are many people who look at this and just say, that's just a bunch of rules that I don't like. When God would say to us, no, this is your life. Listen to it. Listen to me. Instead, we're supposed to be those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere as being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts. He will be blessed in his doing. And so then James uses a word. So the man comes up and he looks intently in the mirror like this, and he, he's looking himself. Basically, it's the idea of he looks himself up and down. He sees, he sees, he sees, he sees. And he even sees something wrong, but then he walks away, and he doesn't even remember it. He looked, he looked, he looked, and he saw but then he went away and didn't see anymore to do anything with it. But then he uses a different word for the one who looks into the law. He says the man who looks intently into the perfect law, the law of liberty, does it like this. He stoops down and he looks in. It's the same word used for Peter and Mary when they stoop down to look into the tomb of Jesus and see that he was gone. And in some ways, I like that picture because this is very humbling. This is very humbling to come before God and get on your knees and accept his word. And that's exactly what we're supposed to do. Come underneath his word, humbly accept it. And, as I've said to you before, don't do Bible study. Let the Bible study you. If you want to just study the Bible to get a bunch of knowledge and don't do anything about it, you'll be messed up. But if you come to this to find your life and to do life with God, you'll be blessed. That's the way. The perfect law, it's from God, it doesn't change. And it brings good things. And it brings liberty. 
He says, perseveres in it. He says, law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets. He perseveres. He, he just sticks with it. See, the one thing I'm so glad for the Lord is in the way he deals with us is that he just, he is not really worried about our mistakes. He wants us to attempt, to risk, to try, but to do it towards him, not for him. I may be overstating my case there a little bit. He wants us to trust him more than be good. He wants us to walk in his law, and he will bless us. Blessed means an enviable position. Blessed means to be an, in an envied position. And uh, there's nothing more blessed than to be in, in peace when everybody else is in turmoil. Nothing more to be blessed than to know that you're loved when you feel unlovely. These are the ways of God. So as I bring this to a conclusion this morning, you know, a doer is going to be a poet of some kind. He's a, a practical believer is going to be somebody who, who puts the word of God into action in such a way as that they intake it, they take it in, they let it, they let it be there. They ask questions about it, and they go to God with them about it. Lord, what am I to do with this? How am I to do this? They find that they'll maybe make mistakes. That's what repentance is for. And then they'll find after a while, wow, there really is something to this. I'll just use again myself for, uh, for 20 years. I'd say 20 years. I've had a goal weight. I've had a weight, and I, and I want to be really careful with our bodies. Our bodies are got to be really careful. Um, I know how it's just, I got to be really careful when I talk about bodies. I'm just going to talk about me. I had a goal weight in mind. I knew I'd eaten too much. I'd eaten too much donuts. I'd eaten too many sweets. I've eaten too many things. I'd, oh, all this stuff. I just, I knew that I wasn't really taking good care of my body. I knew I wasn't. And I'd try, and I'd fail, and I'd try, and I'd fail, and I'd try, and I'd fail, and I'd try, and I'd fail. And something just happened this time, and I can't even say that. But the longer I went and the more results I saw, the easier it was to keep doing good things. I don't want to go back to the slavery that I had in some things I ate. Now, I know this is not a crossover application all the way. All I'm saying is this, is that I believe that if you make it your heart's desire to walk with God and ask him, as James says, anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it. He loves to give it. You will find that he will begin to lead you more and more. Just don't ever let your knowledge get ahead of your obedience. And if your knowledge is ahead of your obedience, you may need to back up a little bit and start over. But don't stop. Don't stop. Trust God. A practitioner believes that God will supply what he promises. A practitioner of the faith, a poet of the faith, will believe that God will supply what he promises. Lord, it's good again to be back in this house. We thank you for it. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. As we leave this place, Lord, may we leave it in a, a desire to rejoice, give thanks, and sing. For our Lord God is King. And may we do it in such a way as that you send us out and to live our lives in, with the people around us. That it's no mistake who we are or where we live or our circumstances. But we can be yours, Lord. Lead us, Lord, in that faith. Lead us. Let the implanted word, Lord, have its true effect in Grace Bible Fellowship.
Lord, that's my heart's desire. That's our heart's desire. We love you. We thank you that you've loved us with an everlasting love, and we will trust in you. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.